Hello everyone, I'm Catherine and I'm a PhD student at Lancaster University. I work in the Department of English Literature and Creative Writing and I study English literature in the main. My specialism is 19th century literature and religion. Today I'm going to begin our session by introducing my approach to studying works of literature and why the use of illustrations are important. The session will alternate between information from me and questions to answer independently regarding a particular illustration. The aim of today's session is that you may use John Leach's illustrations to gain a different understanding of Dickens's A Christmas Carol. The session will also introduce you to some of the ways we approach English at university level, here using visual materials in order to understand a literary text. As a PhD student, my research focuses on the 19th century, the period between 1800 and 1900, but more particularly, the Victorian period. The Victorian period is a term used to name the period when Queen Victoria was on the throne. This was between the years 1837 and 1901, a period of 63 years in total, which I think you'll agree is quite a long time. Queen Victoria was only 18 years of age when she took the throne and until recently was Britain's longest reigning monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, our current Queen that is, has now been on the throne for longer than Victoria was. Here I want to think about some of the important issues and how they can help us to understand the novella A Christmas Carol. In 1843, Dickens's A Christmas Carol was first published, the seventh of his novels to be published in full. I say published in full because Dickens's novels were often published as serials, meaning that they first appeared in weekly instalments in newspapers. A Christmas Carol sold out completely in a period of six days, showing the popularity of Charles Dickens as an author at that time. But Dickens was not the only creator of the novel. John Leach drew the illustrations. At this time, fiction for adults was widely illustrated and images were considered by many to be an essential part of reading. Today, they can help us to understand the book as well. A Christmas Carol was published in what was called the Hungry Forties, a period when an already unequal society was struggling with failed crops and industrialisation was creating new forms of suffering and deprivation for the poor. In A Christmas Carol, stark contrasts are depicted between those who can manage financially, those who are richer, and those who are struggling financially, those who are poorer. This is in no small part due to the narratives of Scrooge and Bob Cratchit, with which Dickens highlights these social differences and exposes how both figures do suffer. For Bob Cratchit, this suffering is financial, and in the case of Scrooge, it is spiritual. Dickens was keenly concerned with the suffering of the poor and the extravagances of the rich, and A Christmas Carol offers insights into what he thought about these subjects and their potential remedies. John Leach's illustrations also weigh in on these issues. The illustrator for A Christmas Carol, John Leach, was born on August the 29th, 1817 and died on October the 29th, 1864. He was a British caricaturist and illustrator and he was best known for his work for Punch, which was a humorous magazine combining verbal and graphic political satire with light social comedy. Satire is a sort of comedy that focuses on political events or social inequalities topics that are also reflected in Dickens's novels. Leach also enjoys fame as the first illustrator of Charles Dickens's 1843 novella, A Christmas Carol. The word novella means a short or mini novel. A Christmas Carol is a novella because it is too short in length to be considered a novel. You may ask, what is the value of looking at illustrations anyway? Why are they important for our understanding of a written text? Firstly, I'm sure you've all heard the expression, a picture is worth a thousand words. 
Indeed, we can interpret many different things through looking at just one picture. The illustrations that Leach provided were placed alongside the text of a Christmas carol and could be interpreted as picturing what the words describe, commenting on them, filling in gaps and more. So the illustrations provide a visual clue to what is going on in the prose. Through examining the illustrations, we can also link to themes that are going on in the story and they can help us to remember what has gone on previously. Lastly, by helping our memory, illustrations can also be used as a revision tool as they provide a break from examining the text and a different way of understanding what is going on. Let's look at the illustrations now. This is a photograph of the inside cover of the illustrated first edition of 1843 with a picture of the festivities of Mr. Fezziwig's Ball next door to the title page. The title reads, A Christmas Carol in Prose, being a ghost story of Christmas by Charles Dickens, with illustrations by John Leach. From the very start of the text, Leach's illustrations are prominent in the story, working to enhance the reader's understanding of Dickens's writing. For your first task, I'd like you to look at the illustration and write answers to the following questions. Number one, what kind of people are in the scene? How are they relating to each other? What does their arrangement in the room say about their relationship? Question two, do you think this is a model for a happy society more generally? If so, why? If not, why not? Question three, how does the picture compare to the title and subtitle of the novella? Does it match? Question four. If you were to draw the scene from the title, A Christmas Carol, and subtitle, A Ghost Story of Christmas, how would you draw it? And lastly, question five. Why do you think that Dickens chose this as the leading illustration for the book instead of others? Please pause this presentation now to take some time to work on this task. So what were your findings? Does the opening illustration remind you of a Christmas celebration or a dance or a festival? From this illustration, what would you expect the overall tone of a Christmas carol to be? Would it be one of happiness and Christmas cheer? Is this in any way misleading? I'll quickly run through some observations you may have made regarding the five questions in the opening task. First question, what kind of people are in the scene? How are they relating to each other? What does their arrangement in the room say about their relationship? Well, the people in the scene are men, women and children. There are two prominent figures in the foreground of the illustration a man and a woman dancing, possibly Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig. To the left-hand side of the illustration, we see in the foreground a boy standing to the side, watching the couple dancing. Behind him, there is a couple kissing under some Christmas mistletoe. Moving towards the back of the illustration on the left-hand side, there is a fiddler playing the violin and the couple in the foreground are dancing along, as are the other men and women partially drawn in the centre background. In the foreground on the right hand side of the illustration, there is an elderly woman sat down with children around her, all looking at people dancing. To each side of the illustration, towards the background are men and women standing to the side and conversing with each other. So, in summary, there are people of all ages represented here, dancing and chatting to each other in a scene of festivity. Some take part in the dancing, others do not. Some choose simply to observe others. But with their different roles, there is a place for them all. The prominence of the couple dancing at the fore of the illustration also suggests their prominence in this part of the story, which matches the picture. And the story makes clear that this couple is Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig. Mr. Fezziwig was Scrooge's employer when Scrooge was young, and we see this part of the narrative during the visitation of the Ghost of Christmas Past. I shall read the corresponding passage to the illustration. 
So this is from the section of the novella called The First of the Three Spirits. In came a fiddler with a music book and went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it and tuned like 50 stomach aches. In came Mrs Fezziwig, one vast substantial smile. In came all the young men and women employed in the business. In they all came, one after another, some shyly, some boldly, some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing, some pulling. In they all came anyhow and everyhow. Away they all went, 20 couples at once, hands half round and back again the other way, down the middle and up again, round and round, in various stages of affectionate grouping. There were more dances, and there were forfeits, and more dances, and there was a cake. Then old Fezziwig stood out, stood out to dance with Mrs Fezziwig. When the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball broke up. Mr and Mrs Fezziwig took their stations, one on either side of the door, and shaking hands of every person individually, as he or she went out, wished him or her a Merry Christmas. The passage suggests the vital role, role that Mr and Mrs Fezziwig play in making these festivities happen and in ensuring that all associated in the workplace are included. The prose emphasises the differences in attitude and feeling amongst the partygoers, which Leach also captures. However, Leach also depicts a variety of faces and ages which Dickens does not reference. Dickens does not mention children here, however, their centrality to the story is highlighted in Leach's illustration. So we can see that illustrations and texts are not identical, but complementary, and that each can emphasise different things. Question number two, do you think this is a model for happy society more generally? If so, why? If not, why not? There are two distinct ways of approaching this question. If you feel that it's a joyful scene, one that brings people together happily, then you would possibly argue that this illustration seeks to highlight a model for a happy society more generally, one which all people within society are included, young and old, even while they have different roles. You might also consider why certain people in the illustration are placed prominently, such as the fiddler above the dancers, or the children and the elderly woman who cannot dance, and of course, Mr and Mrs Fezziwig, who lead the dance itself. Why is that certain figures are more prominent in the illustration than others? If you think that this is not a model for a happy society more generally, it may be that your attention has been drawn to who is excluded from this illustration. Is there anybody in the image that is noticeably poor, for example? The place of work, Fezziwig's business, has been repurposed for the Christmas ball, with the desks pulled back. There is, however, no sign of the desks in the illustration, nor that the scene is also that of a workplace. You may have noticed other details, such as the clothing worn by the figures in the illustration, which indicate that they are working class or middle class people. There are no unemployed or very poor people in the scene anyway, and they're excluded from this festive utopia. How does the picture, question three, sorry, how does the picture compare to the title and subtitle of the novella? Does it match? The subtitle provides a clue to what the novella is about, a ghost story of Christmas. This subtitle suggests that the novella is, a, is complex. It is a complex novella. We have joys of Christmas and celebrations represented through Leach's illustration and by the main title, A Christmas Carol. When read alongside the illustration and the title, however, the subtitle A Ghost Story of Christmas does not seem to be in keeping with the theme of celebration. A ghost story is neither a Christian tradition nor a happy story, and put alongside the festive illustration, the reader can anticipate that there will be a darker undertone to the story of Christmas. Question four, if you were to draw the scene from the title A Christmas Carol, and subtitle, A Ghost Story of Christmas, how would you go about drawing it? This question asks you to shift from reading an illustration, 
to creating one or two illustrations yourself and to interpret Dickens's words with your own pictures. I've asked you to imagine what you would draw to represent the title and subtitles of the novella. Your pictures may well be very different from Leach's illustration here, depicting Mr. Fezziwig's ball. How have you imagined the illustration? Have you gone for a literal illustration and drawn, drawn Christmas carolers haunted by a ghost? Or ghosts singing a Christmas carol? Or have you simply drawn some other kind of ghostly scene depicting the subtitle of the work? Would you have simply moved Leach's illustration of Scrooge visited by Marley's ghost to the title page? Or depicted Scrooge visited by one of the three Christmas ghosts? How would that have changed your first impression of what this story is about or altered how you read the relationship between the title and the subtitle? Now you can return to thinking about why the image of Fezziwig's ball was chosen to accompany the title page. So then lastly, looking at question five then, did you think that Dickens chose this as the leading illustration on purpose? What was the intention here? Why did he choose this illustration for the front cover of the book instead of others? This question requires thinking about the book as a whole and all of the illustrations. What exactly makes a good illustration to include in the title pages? How does one illustration encompass the whole of the novella? We have now gone beyond asking what is represented in the scene and we're now scrutinizing why this illustration was chosen to be printed alongside the title page. The scene is festive and represents a ball enjoyed by an employer and his employees. Is it an accurate representation of Christmas or is it an ideal? Does the illustration represent a perfect Christmas rather than a realistic one for early Victorians? For me, the illustration represents an ideal image of Christmas one that's in the nature of sharing and providing a celebration for all, and particularly for those that are not as wealthy as you are, in the case of Mr. Fezziwig, that is. The spirit of sharing has become synonymous with the image of Christmas, and I feel that this is in no small part due to the message of a Christmas carol itself. The well-known moral or message of Dickens' story is why I think that the image of Mr. Fezziwig's ball was chosen as one of inclusivity, festivities and sharing. The next slide presents another of John Leach's illustrations, one that is important for understanding the beginning of A Christmas Carol and some main themes that run throughout it. For your next task, I would like you to examine the illustration closely and write down answers to the following questions. I will then run through my own reading of the illustration and what I think it means. Firstly, question one, what is going on in this illustration? What is in the foreground and background of the scene? What details did you spot first and why? How does the illustration go beyond describing the text it accompanies? Question two, what do the expressions of the two figures in the illustration mean? What might they be feeling and how is this significant to the story? Question three, what is the significance of the chains around Marley's ghost? What do they suggest about his life choices affecting his experience of the afterlife? And lastly, Question four, how does the appearance of Marley's ghost in this illustration serve as a warning to Scrooge? What details suggest this? Take some time to work on this task now and you can pause the presentation so that you can answer the questions. Pulling back from the list of specific questions you've answered, there are three main questions that we can ask of any illustration. Firstly, what is going on in the illustration? Secondly, does the illustration provide us with details that the prose or the written text does not? How do the illustration and prose inform the themes of the novella? Do they do this separately or together? 
So to respond to the first question, I shall run through what I observed and perhaps what you did too. The illustration I've chosen for you to look at is the appearance of Jacob Marley's ghost in chapter one. The illustration indicates that the room is dimly lit. After all, and I quote, Scrooge liked the darkness, it was cheap. There is, however, a candle at the centre of the illustration, illuminating the face of Marley's ghost. Also, Scrooge is seated by the fireside and he is illuminated by that fire. The light of the fire shows that his face is grimacing. Marley's ghost appears to have a slow and steady movement to it, indicated by his bandages lifting up behind him. He is stepping towards the light so that Scrooge can see him better, but also to enlighten Scrooge and to warn him about receiving the same fate that he has. If we look closely at Marley's waist, we can see the chain around it and what looks to be a padlock and keys. There's also a chain heading off into the darkness behind the ghost at the bottom right hand side of the picture. What is attached to the chain, we wonder? Leech doesn't show us and Dickens doesn't say. The ghost seems determined and if we pan back to his face, we can see his fixed expression moving towards Scrooge. Through examining the illustration, we can see details that the prose does not give us. We can see directly the expressions on the faces of Scrooge and of the ghosts of Jacob Marley, and we can read what they are feeling without having to be told in words. We can also think beyond the story to the story's social context. The prose cited earlier, uh, quote, Scrooge liked the darkness, it was cheap, is suggestive of the concerns that many impoverished early Victorians had to had about being able to heat and provide light in their homes and of earning or having enough money to do so. The point is that Scrooge did in fact have enough money to heat and light his home properly, but he chose not to, in order to conserve money. Here, both the prose and the illustration establish him up front as a miser. A miser is a person who hoards their wealth and spends as little money as possible. Scrooge is a rich miser living like a poor person. The fact that Dickens has included this detail of Scrooge's private habits outside the public workplace not only shines a light on the early Victorian reality that many couldn't afford heat or lighting, but also shows that Scrooge could and decides not to share his riches, not even with himself. Scrooge is not revelling in his riches, whilst others starve. He also deprives himself of comforts, scrolling his money away, seemingly just to accumulate money, not to spend it. Through paying close attention to what is going on in the illustration, we can also get a firmer grasp of the narrative that runs alongside it. We can also enhance our understanding of the main themes of the novella by examining an illustration, either separately or alongside the prose. The most apparent themes in this illustration are haunting, confronting the consequences of one's actions and a destructive relationship to money. The appearance of the ghost haunts Scrooge and strikes fear into him, as we've seen. Marley's ghost is a vision of what will happen to Scrooge if he continues along the path that he's following in life, one of money lending at exorbitant rates and profiting from other people's losses. Marley's ghost, therefore, is representative of a warning as he declares, these are the chains I forged in life. He is indicating to Scrooge that what happened to him in death could also be Scrooge's fate. Marley, then, is not only a ghost from Scrooge's past, but the ghost of Scrooge's future. Importantly, it is in the same short section of the novella that Marley informs Scrooge he will be visited by three ghosts representing Scrooge's past, present and future. So thinking about how the illustrations help us to understand themes in the novella, 
I would like you to examine the illustration on the left hand side of this slide. Jot down a few key words to explain what can I observe in this illustration? What details stand out the most to me? Why is this? Next, what details are in the foreground and which are in the background of this illustration? Why is this significant? What details are only partly sketched in and why might this be? And lastly, what themes in A Christmas Carol are represented in the illustration? Does the illustration go beyond the prose that runs alongside it? To clarify, I'm looking for key words or a short bullet pointed list of your answers. You do not have to write in full sentences for this task. Take some time now to work on this task and pause the presentation whilst you do so. So, what kind of keywords did you use to explain what is going on in the slide? Were there words such as festive, jolly, plump, ghost of Christmas present, beard, happy or joyful? What about food, decorations, fireplace, smoke, robe, nightshirt, nightcap? I'm sure you could offer up many more key words than these. The point is, in order to engage with an illustration, you must first look at what is in it. After that, you can work out how this illustration relates to the text, whether it's a novella, a novel, a poem, or a newspaper article, for instance, and how it informs the themes of the writing. Here are a few of my observations. This illustration depicts the ghost of Christmas present. In the illustration, an altogether jollier scene is portrayed. Scrooge meets the spirit for the first time after being invited to come into the next room. Come in, get to know me better, man, he says to Scrooge in the text. This room is bright rather than dark and gloomy, unlike the room Scrooge is in. By contrast to Scrooge's tiny candle, the spirit is holding a lighted torch or beacon which bellows out smoke at the very top of the illustration. The smoke only affects a small part of the picture and the main scene is not obscured. The ghost is portrayed as he is in the text, as jovial and merry. Scrooge's expression, instead of being grimacing, is smiling, relieved and happy. The picture feels warm, in no small part because there's a roaring fire, but also because there's lots of food, textiles and some Christmas decorations and holly framing the scene. And also because Scrooge is expressing more warmth. The spirit is corpulent and richly dressed in a fur trim robe and with a garland of holly on his head, unlike Scrooge's clothing and thin frame. The illustration is meant to be a rich one, representing the richness of Christmas and generosity of spirit by contrast to Scrooge's miserly life. When looking at the themes that are represented in this illustration, some key words you might have used are Christmas spirit, festive, celebration and feast, amongst others. This is because it's a scene of festivities representing an early Victorian ideal of Christmas, particularly through the ghost of Christmas present. Christmas time for wealthier Victorians was one of festivities, often including gifts, dancing, games, feasting and drinking. Many Victorians, like many people today, saved up money and goods for Christmas time so that they had more and felt richer at Christmas, even if their means were limited, and so that family and friends could eat and share in the abundance and greater consumption of Christmas together. But the ghost of Christmas present represents more than that. He represents the virtue of sharing one's own abundance and cheer, not only with family and friends, but also the poor, as he does. The prose backs these claims up, and this passage that I'm about to read is from the section of the text called The Second of the Three Spirits. It was his own room, there was no doubt about that but it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with green that it looked like a perfect grove. 
The crisp leaves of holly, mistletoe and ivy reflected back the light as if so many little mirrors had been scattered there. And such a mighty blaze was roaring up the chimney as that dull petrification of a hearth had never known in Scrooge's time or Marley's or for many and many a winter season gone. In easy state upon this couch, there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch, in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it up, high up, to shed its light on Scrooge, as he came peeping round the door. Come in, exclaimed the ghost, come in and know me better, man. I am the ghost of Christmas present, said the spirit, look upon me. Scrooge reverently did so. It was clothed in one simple green robe, or mantle, bordered with white fur. Its dark brown curls were long and free, free as its genial face, its sparkling eye, its open hand, its cheery voice, its unconstrained demeanour, and its joyful air. You have never seen the like of me before, exclaimed the spirit. Never, Scrooge made answer to it. Spirit? said Scrooge submissively. Conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion, and I learnt a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you've out to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Scrooge did what he was told and held it fast. For me, <clears throat> the key term that stood out in this section of prose was not the physical description which Leech represents so well, that the words are almost actually not needed, but the dialogue itself, which the picture does not really depict. Tonight, if you've ought to teach me, let me profit by it. Here, Scrooge uses a langu language of commerce, sorry, and profit to indicate that he wishes to learn the lesson that the spirit is teaching him. Not only does he want to learn, he wants to profit from this experience, not by way of making money, as he does in business, but rather spiritually and emotionally. In other words, Scrooge wish wishes to profit through improving his own well-being, which he learns is inextricably linked to the material well-being of others. The role of the ghost of Christmas present is to lead him to this idea of sharing in his wealth and happiness. Over the next few slides, I will run through a couple more leech illustrations, beginning with the next illustration from the one we've just covered. Again, looking at the ghost of Christmas present. So through the next of, of Leech's illustrations, we learn about social inequality through the ghost of Christmas present. The other illustration of the ghost of Christmas present shows us the other side of Christmas, the hunger and anger of those who are shut out from the abundance and jollities of the season. The visitation of the ghost of Christmas present takes a dark turn in this illustration. The spirit is translucent and in the background of the illustration. To the rear of the illustration, we see what looks like a factory chimney and factory or at least industrial buildings. This represents the impact of the Industrial Revolution on early Victorian Britain and the focus on monetary gain and profit of most factory owners at the expense of the lives and health of those who worked in their factories. This is illustrated by the two bare shadows of trees also in the background, representative of the impact that the Industrial Revolution had on the countryside and on the natural world, including human bodies. Our attention, however, is drawn to the three characters at the front of the illustration. Scrooge's stance is unusual. Is he inquisitive about the two ragged children? Or is he worried? Or both? He seems to have a strained expression on his face, which would suggest worry or guilt. The two children standing in rags are representative of ignorance and want, which want means poverty. The children are dirty, ragged and barefoot, and their faces are the faces of elderly people, not children. 
Scrooge is met by the symbolic realisation of the impact that factories and workhouses have on children and the short lifespans of child factory workers at the time. By including the factories, even though there is no mention of them in the prose, Leach is pointing beyond the text to some of its social contexts. Here, Leach is asking readers to step beyond the story, to think about these issues in Victorian society and to share Scrooge's worry and concern. I end my run through of picture analyses by looking at a much more positive illustration, which is also the last one accompanying the story and the one that represents the moral of the story. The illustration on the left hand side of the slide is of Scrooge and Bob Cratchit enjoying themselves by a roaring fire and stove. On the stove is a kettle boiling suggestive of tea, warmth and company. The pair are seated at a table illuminated by the stove and fireplace where they are enjoying what appears to be punch or mulled wine. There are also bottles on the table along with a tall lighted candle. Both are smiling and Scrooge is happy ladling out some punch for himself apparently after he has served Bob. What's changed here? Scrooge is socialising with his employee at home rather than exploiting him in the workplace and serving him instead of the other way around. In the prose Scrooge has agreed to share his wealth with Bob not just at Christmas but also by raising his salary and by paying for medical care for Tiny Tim. Scrooge here is taking on the role of the ghost of Christmas present in sharing his abundance with those less fortunate than himself. At the top of the illustration are Christmas decorations, probably holly, which frame this last merry scene of hospitality and friendship. Scrooge, haunted by the spirits of the previous nights, has amended his ways forming friendships and sharing in the spirit of Christmas. John Leach's illustrations for A Christmas Carol can be accessed online. They are free and legal to use as they are no longer protected by copyright law. They can be accessed from Wikimedia Commons from the link on the slide, or you can just search for John Leach, A Christmas Carol illustrations, and they will come up on Google. You can also access John Leach's illustrations from the Beniki Rare Book and Manuscript Library of Yale University and the link is given on the slide. Uh, once you are there you can type a Christmas carol into their digital search box and a link is also given on the slide if available. I wanted to end the presentation by thanking you all for listening to this workshop on John Leach's illustrations. I hope that you've now been able to gain an understanding in how to read the text by looking at an illustration. If you're interested in finding out more about the English Literature and Creative Writing Department at Lancaster University, please visit the English and Creative Writing Department's webpage for lots of information about the courses we offer, events that we organise and what we do. Tasks are complete after the workshop, interpreting John Leach's illustrations. I have included some written activities to do after you've completed this workshop to cement your understanding of how illustrations can be used to interpret a Christmas carol. I have also set an essay based question with a choice of essay questions to answer using what information you can glean and interpret from the illustration. For this task, I want you to have a go at analysing an illustration and to answer in writing the short questions alongside it, which may help you link it to the themes of A Christmas Carol. The illustration is from quite early on in the text, from the section titled Marley's Ghost, and depicts the usurers that Scrooge sees when he looks out of his bedroom window. A usurer is a person who lends out money at unreasonably high rates of interest, much like Marley and Scrooge did. Examining Leach's illustration on the left-hand side, I want you to answer 
Question one, what is going on in the illustration? What details are in the foreground and which ones are in the background? What figures are highly detailed and in the illustration and which are sketchy outlines? Why do you think this is? Question two, who is the figure in the foreground? What do they represent? Question three, how does this illustration compare with the illustration called Marley's Ghost? How does this more crowded scene compare with the emptier one? And lastly, question four, how do you think Scrooge reacted to seeing these ghosts from his window? For this task, analyse the illustration on the slide. Answer in writing the questions alongside it, linking details in the illustration with possible themes in the story. Examining Leach's illustration, I want you to answer. What details in this illustration are important? How is the illustration framed and what does this suggest? Do the details in the background have any significance? What is the figure of the ghost of Christmas future doing? Why is this important? Question two, how does this image fit in with Dickens's story? How does the visitation of the ghost of Christmas future make Scrooge react? Question three, why does Scrooge react in this way to being shown his own grave? Do you think this is what prompts him to behave in a different way at the end of the novella and why? On this slide, I have provided you with example essay style questions to try out, focusing on John Leach's illustrations. Choose one to answer in full. How might observing John Leach's illustrations whilst reading A Christmas Carol supplement our understanding of the novella? Use examples of illustration analysis in your answer. Do the images you see in your head when reading the prose of A Christmas Carol match with Leach's illustrations? If yes, why? If not, why not? How do John Leach's illustrations differ from the films of A Christmas Carol that you have seen? Using John Leach's illustration, Scrooge and Bob Cratchit after Scrooge's redemption, how far does Scrooge go in order to make amends? How does the illustration add to the detail of the prose running alongside it from the section entitled The End of It? How does John Leach's illustration, Marley's Ghost, highlight the theme of money lending and profiteering? What quotations or phrases in the prose support your observations? Examine John Leach's illustration, The Last of the Spirits. What does the illustration tell us about the moral of the story of A Christmas Carol? Are the details in the illustration different from the prose and why? On this slide, I've included a few additional activities that you may wish to try using the illustrations in A Christmas Carol. Firstly, place one of Leach's illustrations in the middle of an A3 or A4 sheet of paper. Annotate the picture using colour pens if you wish, observing what is going on in the illustration and which themes in the novella the illustration links to. Secondly, draw your own illustrations to summarise parts of the novella. You may wish to focus on a certain section of the story or specific quotations from A Christmas Carol. You could even draw one large illustration to represent the whole of the story adding details from each chapter. And lastly, take a couple of Leach's illustrations and work out where in the text of A Christmas Carol they might be placed. Write down quotations from that part of the story that link with what is going on in the illustrations. You may wish to do this on an A4 piece of paper or on a word processing document so you can place the illustration next to the quotations.
Here is a list of film and television adaptations which you may find helpful and enjoyable, including where to find them. Please pause the presentation if you need to take a closer look. Please see these slides for further illustration references, a citation for the version of the Christmas Carol novella that I used, information for the Victorian age timeline and for information about John Leach. You can also find free e-texts of A Christmas Carol online that include Leach's illustrations.